Thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today we are saying goodbye to 2023 and happily moving into 2024 with a new year, new you commitment. We're studying the book of Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. The life notes are available for download on our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now here's Pastor Chad Garrison. And happy new year. Okay, so don't sound very happy about it. Wow. So, happy new year. Happy new year. Ah, wow. Hey, uh, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is our text today. And if you don't have a Bible with you, Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're at our Sweetwater campus, if you're at our Parker campus, there's a table in the back. Go back there and grab a Bible right now. Turn to page 1,126, that's 1126, and you'll be able to follow along with us as we look at Romans 12. And as always, if you are at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then by all means, please take it. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, ask for one. Just message the service host or, you know, email us at calvaryaz.com. We will get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Can you guys believe that 2023 is almost over? And it has been a year. You know, it's been a year of triumph and tragedies. It's been a year of joys and sorrows, of achievements and failures. It's been a year of brokenness and redemption. And as we think about and maybe prepare for 2024 with hopes and dreams or <laughs> fears and anxieties, however you're anticipating the new year, uh, I want to challenge us from Scripture about how to make 2024 a godly year. Not a great year. You know, everybody's got a definition of what a great year would look like, but uh, that, that's not really the point. The point is, let's, let's make 2024 a godly year, a year where you experience God's love deeply and walk in his wisdom. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sin, was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, you should want that. That should be your goal. I, I want to have a godly year. I want to walk with Jesus. I want to walk in his wisdom. I want to feel God's love deeply in my life. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we want you to become one. Okay, we really want you to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior because we believe that he will change your life and you will be blessed because of it. But uh, as we talk about a godly year, we're going to be sharing with those who are believers in Jesus what uh, that will look like, what that will entail and if you're not yet a follower, please listen in and, and go, hey, these are the expectations that God has for his followers, and we'd love for you to be prepared as you decide to follow Jesus. So uh, here's the Apostle Paul's counsel to the Roman church. Now, he's writing the book of Romans to people he hasn't met yet, so it's not as personal and warm and fuzzy as some of the others. It's also not as harshly rebuking as some of the others. So we, since we st have studied 1 Corinthians and saw the uh, uh, controversies that Paul dealt with. So Romans is a little more uh, sterile, but it's also very, very uh, direct in terms of the challenge. So he's writing this to the people in the church. So he's writing it to us, because we're people in the church. So uh, Romans chapter 12, I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2. Uh, these are great verses. I encourage you to memorize them. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, Paul's challenge to us, not just for the new year, but really for every single day of every single year, is to be a living sacrifice. Be a living sacrifice. That, that's what he wants us to do. He says, hey, uh, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Now, in the ancient world, sacrifices were normal business. Not so much to us. 
I mean, but in the ancient world, when he wrote this, people said, oh, a sacrifice, that's where you take an animal, you know, a sheep, a goat, a cow, a bird, you know, and, and you take it to the, the temple of your God. You know, for the Jews, it was Yahweh in Jerusalem. For the pagans or the Greeks, it was everywhere else. They had temples and you take the animals there and you make a sacrifice and you would put that animal up on the altar and if it passed muster, if it was a good animal, they would kill it in honor of their God, to appease their God, to please their God. And, and then uh, the priest would take it and sometimes you would eat part of it and sometimes you wouldn't. Sometimes they get the whole thing. Sometimes they burn it up. Had all different kinds of rules. But people understood. They said, hey, we under, understand what a sacrifice is. But the concept of living sacrifice was outrageous. It actually didn't make sense. Hey, you know what it is? It's, a, it's an oxymoron. You guys know what oxymorons are, right? I'm not talking about morons. You guys know morons. <laughs> I'm talking about the, the term oxymoron. I'll do a little English language lesson here. So oxymoron is, is a word that, or a phrase or a sentence that, that has contradictory terms in it. So like old news, it's an oxymoron, right? Because new, anyway, figure it out. If, you don't, if these don't make sense to you, <laughs> ask your friends to explain it to you at home. Deafening silence is an oxymoron. Organized chaos, you know, bittersweet is an oxymoron. My favorite, jumbo shrimp. <laughs> right? Oxymoron. And, and so we read this, and we don't even get the, the shock value that the people that were reading it were like, what are you talking about? How can you be a living sacrifice? You kill sacrifices on the altar. And Paul is saying, I want you to be a living sacrifice. Now, obviously, they're also a little bit confused because they're like, how do you put yourself on the altar and yet also live for Jesus? So it's obviously not just sitting on an altar in a, in a temple someplace. Um, so what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? What is, what is he asking us to do? Uh, I'm gonna boil it down to two things uh, that apply to us. First of all, it means do what Jesus commands, not what you want. Do what Jesus commands, not what you want to do. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5 talked about a battle for your soul. If you're a follower of Jesus, then God the Holy Spirit lives in you, and he's the one who's teaching you truth and convicting you of sin and trying to help you to live like Jesus. He's trying to help you to follow Jesus with your life. That's what the Spirit is doing in your life. And, uh, and, and Paul says the Spirit and your flesh are in a battle for control of your life. Your flesh. You guys know what your flesh is, right? Your, your flesh is what, okay, in my case, eat the whole half gallon of ice cream. Because it's not a half gallon anymore anyway, so it's not nearly as bad. Your flesh is the one saying, have another drink, you can handle it. Your flesh is the one saying, it's okay to look at porn. Your flesh is the one that's saying, hey, uh, flirting is not going to hurt anything. Do you see that your flesh is trying to tell you to do stuff that feels good? And, and Paul says you are in a constant battle if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're a slave to your flesh. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you're in a battle for control of your soul. And the Holy Spirit is, is battling against your flesh. And, and you've got to decide which one you're going to indulge. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, he said, look, if you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and come follow me. Deny yourself. This is the battle against the flesh. He says, look, do what Jesus commands, not what you want. In John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me. He didn't say if you love me, you'll worship enthusiastically. If you love me, you'll wear a Christian t-shirt. And say, if you love me, you'll put, you know, Christian bumper stickers on your car. You know, it, it, if you love me, you'll check in at, on social media at church. He didn't say those things. He said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. See, the reality is, if you do what Jesus commands, it will bless you like crazy. But uh, you have to decide if you're going to do that. So... It means, being a living sacrifice means we have to believe Jesus, do what Jesus commands, not what we want, and we have to surrender control to God. See, obedience means that we trust God 
when he doesn't make sense. Look, all of us have a tendency to argue with God. I, you know, I, look, I'm just assuming you do, because I do. It, you know, don't we have a better way of doing it than God's way? God, what you should do is you should do this. The way you should fix this is this. The, the way that the world should work is this. And so we, uh, we try to argue with God, but obedience means that when it doesn't make sense to us, we still obey him. We still surrender control to him. Like when he tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. It doesn't make sense, but he says, do it. He says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. He, he says for us to forgive people who hurt us, to put others' needs ahead of our own needs, to forgive people who hurt us, to be generous, even tithing our income, and even to forgive people who hurt us. See, it doesn't make sense. So here's, here's a, an unfair question I'm gonna ask you. So what is it that you do not want to surrender to God? What is it that you personally don't want to surrender to God? Because that means that right now the Holy Spirit is nudging you, elbowing your soul, and you're saying, I don't want to surrender that. Is it your marriage? I don't want to surrender my marriage. I want to do it my way. It will be better if you do it God's way. Is it your children? This is tough because you think you love your children more than God does, but you don't. You're gonna surrender your children to God and, and if you do, you'll love them more than you do right now and they'll love God more than if you keep loving them more than God. What is it you don't wanna to surrender to God? Is it your finances? I mean, Jesus talks so much about money because he knew we'd struggle with that. He said, give and it will be given to you for with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. He said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. He said, no one can serve two masters. He's gonna love one, hate the other. He's gonna cling to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. What is it you don't wanna surrender? To God, is it your business, your retirement, your time, your serving? See, to be a living sacrifice is to surrender control to the one we call Lord. And if you wanna have a godly 2024, be a living sacrifice and renew your mind. That's verse two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Renewal your mind. By the way, you can't be a living sacrifice if you also don't renew your mind. It's just not gonna work. So I, I want you to know these are connected. Separating them is just for the purpose of preaching a sermon. Okay, it really is. But the, con the pressure for us to conform to this world is incredible. I mean, it's subliminal, it's subconscious. They, they are challenging us all the time with, with, with everything from commercials to social media, everything. They are pressuring us to win the rat race, to get rich, to reject biblical morality, to reject biblical marriage as the right way. They're pressuring us to conform to cultural standards of what is right instead of God's standards. They're pressuring us to value social media likes and followers more than God's approval. The pressure is there. So how do we win this battle for our minds and our values? By renewing our mind. You know, how do you do that? How do you renew your mind? He's, he's telling us to renew our minds what does that look like? Okay, it's gonna blow your mind, but I'm gonna tell you. Read and apply God's word. You may have heard that mentioned once or twice from the pulpit here. Read and apply God's word. Ephesians chapter six, the apostle Paul describes the armor of God. It's a very graphic picture. He equates the spiritual armor of those who follow Jesus with the armor of a Roman soldier. And so you've got the, you know, the, the, all the, all the different pieces of it. So you got the belt of truth. You've got the breastplate of righteousness. You've got shoes for the preparation of the gospel of peace. You've got the helmet of salvation. You've got the shield of faith. Everything's defensive. You know what's offensive? Sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit is what makes us able to fight 
a battle. You know, without the sword of the Spirit, what you, all you could do is, is withstand the blows. You can't fight back. Um, sometimes I wonder if we're a bunch of weaponless soldiers because we don't read and apply God's word. Psalm 119, the psalmist says, thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. He didn't say thy word I have hidden in my phone so that I might not sin against God. <laughs> See, I know you guys have the Bible with you all the time on your device. I can look it up, but do you? Do you? I mean, it's there, but it's not here. So we need to read the Bible. Hey, it's almost 2024. Do you have a Bible plan? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really get nasty now. <laughs> Sorry, I just, how many, I, and I'm going to celebrate some people right now. How many of you read through the Bible in 2023? All right, look at those hands. Way to go. Give, hey, the rest of you, like celebrate them. I know you're feeling guilty right now, but go ahead and celebrate them. Okay, how many of you meant to read through the Bible in 2023 and failed? It's okay, go ahead and raise your hands. This is church, we can confess. Hey, try it again. Try it again. If you just did it, do it again. Look, uh, I, I, by the way, awesome response. Those of you who didn't raise your hand at all, I have a new goal for you for 2024. You know, look, just download the YouVersion app on your phone and, and it's there and you can sign up for a Bible reading plan and it'll tell you what to read. And if you're like, I can't read through the whole Bible, that's okay, read through the New Testament. Do read something. Um, but don't just read it. You also have to apply it. James 1, verse 22, he says, look, be doers of the word and not hearers only and so deceive yourselves. Man, I mean, when I was young, I was like, yeah, be doers of the word, not hearers only. And, and I never really paid attention to the deception part. You see, if we just read it, don't apply it, then we think we're good Christians and we're lying to ourselves. Because I can go back to that part about Jesus where he said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands, not just know them. See, powerless Christians know the word of God, but fail to follow what it says. Uh, so if you want to renew your mind, you have to read and apply God's word and you have to confront the lies of the enemy. Uh, can I just tell you, Satan's weapons against us are fear and lies. That's pretty much it. Everything he does is just, it either makes you afraid so you won't follow Jesus or he lies to you so you chase the wrong thing. Faith is what challenges the fear piece. And truth is what we can confront the lies with. So you gotta confront the lies by knowing the truth. Um, I remember reading this a long time ago, the agents that work for the Treasury Department that are responsible for, you know, uh, fighting against counterfeiting. They don't study the fakes. They study the real thing. Because when they are so familiar with the, the actual bills, the way they're supposed to be, they can spot the fakes because they know the true thing. See, if you know the word of God, then you know the truth. You can see the lies of the enemy. You can spot them. They stand out and you go, hey, that's a lie. I used to drive my girls crazy when they were little and be watching a Disney movie and I'd go, hey, you know, that's a lie. Yeah, dad, we know. Okay, just as long as you know. Hey, you know that's a lie. Because it, it just jumps out. I'm not fun to watch movies with, by the way. Um, <laughs> but when you know the truth, you can see and you can challenge the lies. If you don't challenge the lies, then they're gonna sink in and you'll start to believe them and you'll start to act on them. So what lies of the enemy do you need to confront? I'm just gonna tell you some I've heard people say through the years. God doesn't expect me to <laughs> fill in your blank. God doesn't expect me to serve. God doesn't expect me to love people. God doesn't expect me to forgive them for what they've done. God doesn't expect me to tithe. I don't make enough money or I make too much money. 
God doesn't expect me to be sexually pure. I mean, this is almost 2024. Come on. Or how about the lie of God doesn't love me? God doesn't love me. This is, this is much more emotional lie. You're looking around, you know, I know God loves people, but he doesn't love me like he loves them. And there's some of you who are sitting here who really believe, you've believed this lie, you, you think that God doesn't love you as much as he loves the person sitting next to you or the person sitting across the room or the person up on the stage. I'm just telling you, God loves you. That's why Jesus died for you, to save you from your sin. And, and he wants you to experience his love, but, but Satan will lie to you and he says God doesn't love you. Or the other version of this is God doesn't forgive you. Well, I know that the blood of Jesus covers all of our sins, but God can't forgive me for what I've done. God can't forgive me for what I've done. Yeah, I, I think the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin is all our sin. Doesn't matter what you've done. The Apostle Paul called himself the worst of all sinners. And that's in the Bible, so you can't compare to him. He killed people in the name of God. He killed Christians in the name of God. So uh, go there. So that's a lie. God doesn't love me. God doesn't forgive me. Or how about this? I can't. I can't is one of Satan's favorite lies that he sells us. I can't. I can't change I can't serve. I can't do anything to help. I can't get sober. I can't share the gospel. I can't. See, whatever the lies of Satan in your life, can I just encourage you to confront them with the truth of God and you'll discover freedom? John chapter eight, Jesus said, hey, if you abide in my word, in my teachings, if you live in my teachings, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth sets you free when you actually know the truth and you live the truth. So my prayer is that you choose to be a living sacrifice and renew your mind every day of 2024 and beyond. But right now we're gonna give you an opportunity just to, to kind of focus on that step. Um, we're gonna celebrate communion in a few moments. And if you've never celebrated communion with us, uh, then everyone who is a follower of Jesus is invited to join with us in remembering Jesus' death and resurrection. And you say, well, what if I'm not a follower of Jesus? Well, then I would, uh, I'm, we're like, we don't card anybody at the tables, okay? <laughs> but I'm just gonna say this, we don't encourage you to be a hypocrite. Okay, we don't want anyone to be a hypocrite. And if you don't believe in Jesus, if you haven't given Jesus your life, then there's no point in you celebrating his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins, okay? We want you to get there, but um, this is for those who have already committed their life to following Jesus. And, uh, and in a you know, few moments, I'm gonna invite you to get up from where you're seated and move to one of the tables. There's two in the front, two on the sides, two, uh, two in the back, two in the sides, two in the front. And, and get the elements and go back to your seat. And then when everybody has gotten them and returned to their seats, we're gonna take it together. Uh, that's what we're gonna do today because it's the new year. We're gonna do this uh, a little differently than we normally do here at uh, Sweetwater and in Parker. So we're gonna, we're gonna do this together. But uh, before we get there, I wanna give you a few moments to reflect. I wanna give you a few moments to prepare. Uh, and I want to, if you will, call this communion reflection. But I just want to spend uh, some time preparing our hearts and minds to surrender to Jesus because he has saved us. And what I want to do is I'm just going to ask you not to talk. If you want to write, that's fine. But you might just want to close your eyes and think through these as we spend some time in reflection. I'm going to ask you four questions. And then I'm going to just give you some silence for you and God to talk about these. And, uh, and just prepare your heart to say, Jesus, uh, you're my Lord, you're my Savior. I know you died for my sins. I know you're raised from the dead, and I want to be a living sacrifice for you. First question is simply this. What are the sins I need to confess? What is my practiced disobedience? What is my intentional rebellion? What are the sins I need to say, Jesus, I'm guilty, please forgive me? Reflect on that.
God, we thank you that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Second question is, who are the people I need to forgive? Who are the people I need to forgive? And the other side of that is, who are the people that I need to ask to forgive me? You know, God is glorified in our reconciliation. And uh, we are challenged to forgive one another even as God has forgiven us in Jesus. Think about that question. The third question is simply what obedience should I embrace? What is God asking me to do that I should say yes to. Maybe you've been ignoring him. Maybe you've been putting him off. Maybe you've been just saying no. But what is it you need to say yes to God? What obedience should you embrace? Jesus, you said, if we love you, we'll obey you. The final question I want to ask as we prepare to celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection is simply, why am I grateful? What are the things that you want to say thank you to God for in your life? Why are you grateful? For salvation, for forgiveness, for the blessings, for the people? Just take a moment and give thanks to God. The Apostle Paul said, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I'm going to invite you now, as followers of Jesus, to move to the tables, get the elements, and remember, hold them together until we can all celebrate communion together. Scripture tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. Father, we are your people. And you know how broken we are. You know how we struggle to obey. We're not pretending to be good. We're not pretending that we have any righteousness of our own. We recognize that everything that we are and every promise uh, of life eternal, of blessings, comes from you and your goodness alone. And so, Lord, we acknowledge the, the pain, the failure, the loss, the grief, the sorrows, the rebellion of this past year. And we confess those knowing that your grace is enough to forgive us. God, we recognize the victories, the triumphs, the blessings, the celebrations of this past year. And we acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from our Father in whom there is no shifting shadow. 
We know you're the source of life, you're the source of healing, you're the source of hope, and you're the one who has promised us heaven. So we want to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you, which is our spiritual act of worship. God, we yield our whole lives, our hearts, our minds, our mouths, our hands, our talents, our resources to your control. We'd ask that you'd change us so that we could live for you even better in this coming year. We are yours and we thank you for loving us, for saving us, for adopting us as your sons and daughters and for allowing us the privilege to be your servants. Help us to be faithful until that day we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. I appreciate the points that Pastor Chad made. First of all, we should be a living sacrifice by doing what Jesus commands and not what we want. To renew our minds, we must read and apply God's word. And while participating in communion, it's important to reflect on our behavior. What sins do I need to confess? Are there others I need to forgive? And am I being truly grateful for what God has done in my life? If we commit to doing those things, 2024 will be a year of growth. Well, that's all for now. I hope you'll join us again next year. Bye-bye.